that's how he ends up. We scan the regions of a planet, we immediately see that humanity has disappointed God's expectation. You can't put it better than that. So I think that summarizes uh, the, for the need of environmental ethics. So here we are. So what are the environmental ethics anyway? It's about models uh, where we need to distinguish between the right and wrong. It's about values again. Uh, it's about the ultimate worth. Is it worth to destroy that mountain for an immediate reason? What is the immediate reason for that politician? There's only jewels for his wife, for his children, bangles, and for himself some bank balance. So that is the immediate need. And he is destroying what huge, uh, huge temple of God. God built that temple and he is destroying. And the whole modern society is calling progress. What is wrong with human mind? That is the destruction, that is the vandalism. Then you are destroying the temple of God, but still you call it a progress? There must be something wrong with the human mind. That only they call that is a progress. That is a disaster. He should be arrested and thrown for his rest of his life and behind bars. So that is what we need to see. There is no value system. Environmental ethics means moral relationship between humans and the world around us. It's a moral relationship in terms of right and wrong. Yeah. So, unfortunately, the church has not given this education for the past 2,000 years. That is the bad note I want to give you. That is the low down. Never they told us, never they taught us, they taught Christology, Ecclesiology, Canon Law, Mariology, all that thing, but never they taught how to relate with nature, how to relate what makes my relationship right or wrong, how I should do, how I my approach should be towards soil, water, air, other forms of life, nobody taught. Even the Bible puts it, hundreds of texts, hundreds of texts, it's telling the first chapter one, chapter two, I will discuss it later on, six principles the Bible is giving us, what to do and what not to do, but nobody looked in that aspect, so we failed, we failed. It is called sin of omission. So the leaders, the popes, the bishops, archbishops, cardinals, priests, theologians and philosophers, sin of omission. Yeah. So we have been not taught at all, sadly. Sadly. So that's why we ended up in a big disaster. So now, Thank God Pope Francis wrote the first document to teach us how to have a moral relationship between humans and the rest of creation. The first document is available. It will be good for another 500 years. So every <coughs> interpretation, reconstruction, etc., etc. will be built on this document. So, environmental ethics teaches us how we are grounded in our relationship with the natural world. Here are the, some of the examples I want to give you about the environmental ethics. Is humankind more important than other creatures? I'm asking. That is the ethical question. For example, here we came, we know that they were deer were living here. And is it Necessary for us to build a seminary here? Because already deer and monkeys are occupying this place. If we had ethics, your uh, provincial or your uh, general would have told, no, we shouldn't go there. Because already there are creatures there. So it is 
wrong to intrude their habitat. It's known as technically habitat. So we shouldn't destroy their habitat. India is the famous country, it's the greatest country on the planet Earth. Sare Jagasi Acha. That is true in terms of environmental ethics. India was the first one to formulate environmental ethics 2,500 years ago. Artha Sastra of Kaudalyas. He wrote that book, What Rights the Non Living for Having? What Rights the Living Animals for Having? Always he included in the unity that is creation, the beast and man, beast and man, that is the word being used. Even Ashoka, in his pillar edicts and rock edicts, he writes, Beast and men. First he puts beast because they came first. Beast and men. Beast and men. Beast. I have formed a banyan trees for the beast and men. I have dug wells for the beast and men. I have planted medical gardens for beast and men. See, they first came beast, 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 beast. And then men came. So, it's unbelievable ethics we have. So, is humankind more important than other creatures? No. We are all equals. Our brotherhood, Pratali Tuti, we are all equal in fraternity and social friendship. We become equal because God created us a single one cosmic family. I already explained what Francis of Assisi wrote in the 13th or 12th century, the cat of the creature. Do the immediate interest of living persons count more than the needs of unborn generations. Yeah, see? See, our ethics, it's not only distributed to the living generation, and also it extends to the intergeneration. It is called intergenerational justice. So, is it lawful that we should take and use in excess the fossil, the non-renewable resources? in order to uh, benefit our own life. No, we shouldn't use. Certain amount of fuel should be kept. Certain amount of resources should be kept for the future. That is environmental ethics. Is pollution bad only if it interferes with human interests and concerns? Is it bad? Only because it affects us. Even if it doesn't affect us, a small amount of pollution that is enough to kill the kingdom of Monara, the kingdom of Protista, they are the smallest organisms. They will not able to continue their existence. They go extinct immediately. Little bit of poison is enough. They are out. In fact, already they are all dead. Only maybe 10% of the bacteria will be existing now. Insects disappear. So that is what they are asking. Uh, with the human interest and concern. I mean, today we are doing something because it affects us directly. That's why we are making it as a big issue. If it's not affecting you, we would have never even talked about it. Never, ever. Is nature here only to serve humans? It's the nature. In other words, only human species is most important. No. Environment ethic teaches you all the species are important. It's known as the species equivalence. That is the word we will learn later on. Species equivalence. Equal we are. Do you animals and plants and perhaps even rivers, ecosystems and biomes are right? See? The non-living. All of it is non-living. The, the, the upper part was living. Do our rivers have rights? Yeah, they have rights. Do frogs have rights? Yeah. So what are those rights? Rights come in three forms. Only three. For all the same rights. One is to exist. It's the basic fundamental right. The second is to flourish. In other words, to bring out their young and promote their own species welfare. Understand that? That's the second one, to flourish. First one is to exist. 
Second one is to flourish. The third one is to fulfill their role for the common good of the universe. Every creature and every living and non-living being, they possess a role to play for the common good of the universe. Whether it is a bacteria or whether it is an animal, whether it is a uh, soil or whether it is a dinosaur or whether it is a blue whale, everybody plays a role contributing to the common good of the planet, universe, etc. and etc. You understand that? So now these three rights extend not only to animals and plants and also for us. And we know to exist very well. That we invented all sorts of tablets and medicines to exist longer. And then we uh, promote our only species and there are 8 billion people on the planet and coronavirus tries its best to reduce the carrying capacity of the earth but it is failing. In every, the cyclones are coming to take half of the human population, the, the earthquake is coming and everywhere Swami came and took some of us but within four years they produced triple the amount <laughs> completely. Now all the cataclysmic events are thinking how can we control this population? And they are killing us. Coronavirus is a factor that limit our population, you know. In nature, it is called, it is a, a carrying capacity of the earth. That's a term which explains how many humans can live and how many elephants can live in this ecosystem, how many rabbits can live. That's called carrying capacity of the rabbits or carrying capacity of elephants. So here in this campus or in this classroom, let's put it here, there is grass. How many rabbits can live here? Okay, 10 rabbits because rabbits reproduce very fast. So fast they produce and then 10 rabbits become 20 or they become 40. So with everybody will die. Everybody, because grass is not sufficient, population is too much. Everybody, carrying capacity is gone. They have produced beyond carrying capacity of the earth. So now, to control that, to equate that, to balance that, nature has invented the fox. Now fox comes and eats half of the rabbits and keeps in balance constant 20 rabbits or 10 rabbits. Plus 5. That's it. The rest of them, they die old age or the fox coming and eating them. So this ecosystem is sustainable forever and ever Amen. So in nature everybody has a predator. Predator means an outer force that comes and eliminates the extra input. So now only species doesn't have any predator because humans are the top predator. He is the top most, he is the superstar of the predator. So nobody is coming. Coronavirus is coming. Already coronavirus is almost dead. Almost dead. And cancer has come. Almost cancer is also dead. Cyclones dead. Earthquake dead. Tsunami dead. So only top predator is thriving, flourishing, and he is going beyond its carrying capacity. The same thing will happen to the rabbits unchecked here. If there is no fox, what would happen? All the rabbits will go to extinction. That is what is going to happen very soon. All the humans will Die. 8 billion and no channel to report this big event in the cosmos. Address the Lama for Without address, he died there without any information. So 8 billion people dying, no information reached to anybody <coughs> in the universe. In the universe. Actually, you see, the 
the cat gives birth, the cat looks at the kitten, oh my God, there are 10 kittens. I have only little milk, only five babies or six babies I can so immediately the cat can decide. And he just eats four kittens. Tiger gives four to eat. So it's a medically, it can be explained, but philosophically I'm talking. So immediately he knows the carrying capacity. That sense is built in animals, in nature. Also human sense is built in, but we don't listen to instinct, we listen to reason. So immediately we produce more children, more children. We never even think about the poor planet. Uh, uh, I mean, today, all the parents think about it, nobody will get children. If everybody reads IPCC, nobody will get children. Everybody will become heralds of good news and they will all come and make priests and nuns and send them, go and proclaim the good news of salvation. Whole world, 8 million people, sisters and fathers, after reading IPCC. So that is what we have come to that level. So I think that that cat is more sensitive to the carrying capacity. Mice, all the creatures are sensitive and they, it is an ecological principle. So there are ecological principles there. You see it comes with the principles and the laws. Like in Psalms very often we read, uh, God has provided the principles but every principle is violated when it comes to humans. Humans have completely distorted everything and now only species is flourishing. Flourishing means it's an illusion. Eight billion people. Next by 2050, 10 billion people. Where is the food? Where is the water? Where is the air? Where is the things for our lifestyle today? Many people think only one billion people, that is the carrying capacity of here. Only one billion can live, given the chance of this lifestyle. Big houses, refrigerated cars, only one billion. But some hundred years ago in India, we could have even 10 billion people, no problem. With the bullet cart, with the cloud, with all those systems, 10 million, 15 million, also easily we can live on the planet. But the present lifestyle, only one billion. We are already seven billion in excess. So that is the IPCC red alert. Good evening, brothers, again. Good evening. Good morning, we have been discussing about uh, what environmental ethics is all about, especially I gave these examples uh, before lunch. We discussed about them. So we will continue now, okay? Just to uh, refresh your memory, the, we were doing discussions on is humankind more important than other creatures? Do the immediate interest of living persons count more than the needs of unborn generations? Is pollution bad only if it interferes with human interest and concerns? Is nature here only to serve humans? Do animals and plants have, perhaps even rivers, ecosystems and biomes have rights? So that was the discussion. I told you there are rights. I told you three fundamental rights. One is to exist, to flourish, to fulfill their role for the welfare of the common, common good of the universe. So we'll continue that. Next slide. Uh, why it's not oh yeah. Yeah. Do we have special duties, obligations, or responsibilities to other species or nature? Yeah. We have been told that we are stewards. I mean, we can be of help to other creatures. We don't have to be always tyrants, uh, pressing nature, abusing nature. We can be a little bit of useful. We can do that. So we talked about stewardship. 
So far, we have been practicing the role of stewardship in the sense of mastery over nature. Mastery, like a master. But here, we need to go for a servant paradigm, serving. That is the paradigm we have forgotten. So the servant paradigm includes three characteristics for a steward. Responsibility, faithfulness, accountability. These are the three words. In fact, Jesus teaches these three uh, uh, characteristics and he insists a faithful servant should have these three characteristics of responsibility, faithfulness and accountability. Are there ethical principles that constrain how we use resources or modify our environment? So, we are changing the very nature of the environment by its altering ecosystems. Once upon a time it was a natural ecosystem here and today it is man-made ecosystem because of human intrusion. You know, yesterday I went to Telangana's uh, <coughs> Kenasari uh, Kena Kena yeah, yeah. Kena National Park. So I just went and visited there. I mean, once upon a time it was a natural ecosystem or natural forest. But today you go there, before you enter the National Park, you find the huge factories. Huge! There are about at least 10 huge mega chimneys spewing out, belching out smoke into the atmosphere. I filmed them. In fact, one video you must have seen, no? Such a huge mega chimneys, I mean, next to the National Park, the animals are living, and it is an Indian National Park, but how come the lawmakers have allowed such a mega factory next to the National Park? I don't understand. That is very sad. In India always we have been uh, very sensitive towards beast and man. I told you this morning, but here this is a contrary. I am contradicting my statement right now. So it doesn't look good at all. It's very bad. That is not the place uh, for industry to be starting. That is sad. So are there ethical principles that constrain how we use resources or modify our environment? There are guidelines. But clearly in this event, we see that no guidelines were followed. There was no environmental impact assessment was made there. Nothing. In other words, if this factory comes here, what are the impacts? What is the damage? And who is going to pay for the damage? And who will take responsibility when something bad, it's already bad happened? Who is going to take responsibility? There is a dam there, there is a water there. All those emissions, the carbon emissions, they go and they mix with the water. The carbon easily is soluble in water. So now the water becomes carbonic. And those who drink that water, naturally they will be affected. They don't even care. The research shows bad things happen when you install a factory next to a lake or a reservoir or a national park or a settlement. Also there is a settlement there, you know that place there, the, what is the name of the place? Palomia. Palomans. Palomans. Yeah. There are humans also living there and I don't know how they allow such a mega factory next to the settlement. That factory should have been kept somewhere in the desert in Rajasthan. <laughs> somewhere in Rajasthan. But they have put it right in the heart of human habitat and animal habitat. Look at that. Maybe some bribes. They bypassed everything. They paid money and then 
they got the permission and they installed now, it's too late. It's already damaged, has been done. So are there guidelines? Yes, there are guidelines, but enforcement of that laws is absolutely absent in India. Or even if they enforce, money played it. For well, Francis is writing in the fifth chapter, I already told you, you know, in the last chapter also I told you those three, uh, uh, what is that, uh, the, the three important things that we are, uh, that is ecological education, ecological spirituality, ecological lifestyle and habits, I told you. So the last one is how are our obligations and responsibilities to nature weighed against human values and interest. Mm. Our, I told you, you should be responsible, faithful and accountable, your obligations. How should we weigh it against human values? In other words, there are two uh, values we need to uh, illustrate here. One is called instrumental value. Another one is called intrinsic value. These are the two values. Humans know about it. Humans know it. They uh, talk in philosophy, ethics. Did you study ethics already? <laughs> oh, you look as if you never studied ethics at all. So ethics already in philosophy, it is being taught. And uh, there is the intrinsic value and instrumental value. So, we are uh, actually uh, weighing against these two values. Instrumental values, what is useful for humans? Coconut trees are useful, mango trees are useful because we eat the fruit and we enjoy, bring some money, so it's a money crop, so we value because there is instrumental value, money value, economic value, all right. The intrinsic value is humans, they don't have any income. They are existing for the sake of existing and they do fulfill their role for the common good. That is intrinsic value. They are all doing something, they may not be useful to you, but still they are doing something for the welfare of the cosmos. That is intrinsic. The good example can be, you know, Jesus' parable of the uh, wheat and the tares, the weeds. You remember that parable? The wheat, uh, it, it, uh, wheat was sown, but suddenly the stewards found out there was uh, weeds are also coming up, and they reported there are weeds there. Can we pull them out? And the master says, No, don't pull them out. Allow them to grow, we will put them out on the last day. That is the good example of instrumental value and intrinsic value. So actually, instrumental value is that wheat is going to give you money. That's why you are going to pull out the weeds, because they are not useful. But the master knows better and he, and also he doesn't know what the, uh, what the weeds are doing, ignorant. So humbly he is telling, don't pull them out, because we don't know what they are doing, what is the purpose of weeds. So today we know what is the purpose of the weeds. The weeds are nitrogen fixers. You know, there is three times more than oxygen. Nitrogen is present in the atmosphere, you know that? Almost 70% is nitrogen, only 20% is oxygen, isn't it? So here, why nitrogen is more? Why oxygen is less? Because oxygen breathing organisms are only one third. The rest of them are all nitrogen breathing organisms. Who breathe nitrogen? Microscopic bacteria, Monera, Protista, they depend on nitrogen. And the plant kingdom, you know we put nitrogen based chemicals, isn't it? In the field, no fertilizers. Everything is made from nitrogen. So in the atmosphere, there is natural nitrogen, and uh, wheat can't produce. It can't tap 
nitrogen into the atmosphere directly and use it, unfortunately. Grass also can't do it and uh, rice also can't do it. That's why we are putting chemical input, nitrogen from outside. But weeds, you know, next to the rice and next to the wheat and next to the groundnuts, you know there are weeds there, but we are pulling them out. But actually they are they have the nitrogen roots. Weeds they carry nitrogen roots, they are known as the nitrogen fixing nodules. For example, you know the groundnut plant, you pull the groundnut plant, you take the groundnuts, but still there is an illusion that there are groundnuts, isn't it? They are the nitrogen fixers. By the way, peanut plant, groundnut plant is a nitrogen fixing plant. That's why our agricultural uh, officers always say one time you cultivate uh, the groundnut and then you can cultivate two times uh, rice because the groundnut fixes the nitrogen and it charges the soil full of nitrogen. Even the food, the, our animals love to eat the dried groundnut uh, uh, food, no, because it's rich in nitrogen. So it is called nitrogen fixing nodules. You know the largest plants in the plant kingdom are known as fabaceae. Fabaceae. Fabaceae means nitrogen fixers. You know the neem tree? The neem tree is a fabaceae, nitrogen fixer. You know the rain tree? Huge tree with the they call it the Tamatumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumumum
from Australia, Parthenium, it's a weed. All these are intrusive plants. They intrude our habitat and causing damage to the local vegetation. Yes, they do. There is no doubt about it. So that's why the government want to destroy them. But if Jesus was here, he would have told, no, oh, allow them to grow. Maybe there's a purpose there. We don't understand. Still we consider them intrusive. Why they intruded our habitat? Maybe there is good and bad. Maybe in the long run, they might, they might do some mutations that will benefit to the local community, not only humans, for soil and for other. So always we should express our humility. Uh, admit, I don't know. Let, let them grow. Let, them, let us allow them. So because they might uh, do some intrinsic value stuff. They may not be useful for instrumental purposes. Instrumental, no, but intrinsic, yes. So that is what Jesus is teaching uh, in this uh, parable. So human values should be uh, including not only instrumental, intrinsic. So far we have been using only instrumental value as a standard. Okay, that is useful, cut them out, destroy everything. But when you give intrinsic value, then you won't destroy it all. Everything you will contemplate before destroying. And rather you will protect them, not destroy them. Once you destroy them, once you protect them, yeah, they may be useful in the future. So that is what the example. So what is environmental ethics basically? It is the discipline in philosophy that studies the moral relationship of human beings to and also the value and moral status of the environment and its non-human content. Right? Non-human content means animals, plants, fungi, etc. So environmental ethics expands the moral circle of inclusiveness. So didn't I say it is the inclusion of every science. The environmental ethics includes eco-theology, eco-spirituality. It includes geology, biology, even genetics. I mean even canon law, even Mariology, ecclesiology. All the stuff you study. When environmental ethics emerged as a new sub-discipline of philosophy in the early 1970s, it did so by posing a challenge to traditional anthropocentrism. Did I say we develop an anthropocentric philosophy? Man is the uh, reigning supreme organism. All other organisms are supposed to serve the reigning homo sapiens. That is how we developed the philosophy and theology. So actually it was a challenge. When the environmental ethics appeared, immediately they denounced anthropocentrism. They took the man and threw him out. No, no, you are not going to sit on a big chair and command everything. You are also part of nature. Come down. We are all one, equal. So that is what happened. In the first place, it questioned the assumed moral superiority of human beings to members of other species on earth. In the second place, it investigated the possibility of rational arguments for assigning intrinsic value to the natural environment and its non-human content. See, so far we have been only judging in, the, in terms of instrumental value. That is how we weigh against our actions towards nature. But now, intrinsic value was included. That means, you can't. That means, I don't think you will 
you will be able to destroy anything, change anything. So I think you have to really ethically have to see. There is no other possibility, you can't escape. So you are constrained by ethics itself. So you will not make any mistakes around this. So when you do all this, Aram is being practiced. So now we have come to a, a small subheading called evolution of ethics. So evolution means it is change, changes over time. So we call it a pre-ethical past, ethical past, present, future. So the ethical past is we are talking about some 10,000 years before. The ethics was confined to only self, only individual uh, was deciding, okay, it is good for me, it is good or it is bad. Stealing the food was good in those days. Taking another man's wife is seen ethical. So when the husband died, they went and stole the wife and the children and their property. So that was old timers ethics then came ethical past after 10,000 families appeared tribes appeared religion appeared so ethical past was confined to not only individual self it was extended to family members first okay if i get some food let me share with my wife with my children then it came tribe my caste my tribe that is the thing uh, uh, ethics was extended. Then it came religion, larger institution. Okay, Christians means we are all one, let us share. So that was the ethics. Then came present now. Now it is extending to nations, not only one country, other countries, race, humans, also animals we are including today. We are talking about it at least. We are not yet included, but India included them. 2,500 years ago, even our China monks wrote about against animal sacrifice. So even the Judaic prophets also like Hosea, it is not sacrifice, it is mercy. All these prophets talked about against animal sacrifice. So that was the days when all those epics were written in India, like 2,500 BC, okay, uh, sorry, 500 BC. That is the time, Sulapadigaram, all Sindhamani, all those great epics and minor epics also, five, Neela Gesi, Udayana Kumarakavya, Vyasodhara Kavya, all those small epics were written. All of them deal against the animal sacrifice. That is the point. So that means animals were included long time ago. So they were talking, Asoka also writing, beast and men, beast and men, Artha Sastra, 500 years before Christ. So see the discussion of environmental ethics. Even 2,500 years ago, these people were concerned about poor creatures. And Jaina and Buddha, two religions, they came to be in India just to denounce animal sacrifice. Brahmanism, caste and animal sacrifice. So Jainism and Buddhism both denounce Brahmins, caste system and animal sacrifice. Yeah. Such a power in India. Two religions appeared. Yeah. Not to abuse animals. Yes. It's unbelievable. So India is the land of ethics, the birth of ethics. So future of it looks so far we have been extending our compassion and ethics to only the living parts. But now we are entering into non-living parts. Ethics is including now in the future. In the future, plants, life, rocks, ecosystems, planet, universe. So our consciousness is expanding to include the living and the non-living. So we are moving towards kingdom of God. So the realization of kingdom of God is nothing but the realization of the righteousness, the right action, 
the ethical action and aram. So that is the most important thing. Aram is the vital, it is epicenter for environmental action. So you got that point right, I hope. So we can also divide uh, the ethical uh, time period in terms of human activity. Didn't I say IPCC has now pinpointed and they have declared that uh, there is no doubt, it is beyond doubt that global warming is caused by human activity. That is the word, human activity. Yeah, so I am telling you that let us examine human activity for the past 4 million years. 4 million means 40 lakhs of years humans were walking on the earth. Or almost 150 billion humans have passed in the 40 lakh of year, years, starting from starting from us, Polopithecus afarensis, that is the first species which stood on two legs because our ancestors 40 lakhs years ago walking on four legs. Suddenly one day two legs, straight up. So then evolution started and then came Australopithecus, Bozii, and then came uh, Homo, Ergaster, Homo, uh, Abelis, that is the handyman, one who made tools like stones, fire, is known as the Homo habilis. And then came Homo erectus, who came out of Africa. So all humans are from Africa, that is the accepted theory today. Nobody came from anywhere, only Africa. So in our blood, everybody is from Africa. So we are all Africans. Uh, the bloodline goes only to Africa. So Homo erectus came out of Africa, that became Indian. Uh, other uh, races we call it, no? Like uh, Negroids, that is the one race that is African Negroids. And the second race is uh, Mongols. Mongols is Chinese. They can't open their eyes fully <laughs> by the <laughs> <laughs> The third one is Caucasians. Caucasians. That is the biggest race, the Europeans. All Caucasian, white people, Americans and Indians also Caucasians. Because Indians, only color is different, but faces, noses, eyes, it, exactly like Americans. So we are known as Caucasians, race. And then came Polynesians, that is this side, New Zealand, Polynesia, Papua New Guinea, big, giant people, huge. And then another race is Amerindian, American that long hair and that is uh, uh, native people of America and also South America like Aztec, Inca, Maya, all those people you see in uh, uh, the mission, the movie, no? You must have seen that movie, The Mission. So in that movie, we, have you seen Mission? Yes. Oh my God, that is an excellent movie, it's a Jesuit movie, excellent. You should see that movie first. There, there should be a brother who is jotting out all the movies, please, you, should, you do it. And you write it, one brother jot out all the movies I'm going to tell you, and plus the books, library books, what you should buy. So one brother, please make a note of it. So, the Inca, the Maya, all of them are Americans. So only five races, they are not like Varna, Varna caste system, that is very cheap way of branding. But this one is, there is a difference, it is called genetic variation. So it is based on genetics, so which is true, there, are, there is race. You can't deny there is no race, there is race, but Varna uh, category is not true. It is only mythological, but here these five races are true, Caucasians, Amerindians, Polynesians, Mongols and Negroids. 
five races that exist on the planet. But Indians are now fighting. We don't want to be categorized in Caucasians, but we want to be having separate race. That's why the argument was going on from Dravidian people. Even today they find we are different, we are different. Tamil and the Solodar, Tamil, all those things. Now they are fighting for the entire different race, sixth race. We are different, our noses and our minds and our, uh, our temperament and our legs and everything is different. Very soon they will be showing inside also, ours is also different. <laughs> If they don't give the separate category, they will show in sign also. They will do it. Tamils are capable of that, you know. So, this is the three, for, uh, three types of activity has happened in the past uh, four million years. First is called use. Use means it was balanced. Ecosystem services and the use was balanced. Because there were only a few million people, maybe like two million people, twenty lakhs people on the planet Earth. Complete, maybe some uh, twenty lakhs of years, only between two million to four million. They are known as the hunters and gatherers society. So they used the resources in balance. The input and output was balanced. There was no export. So that's why we call it use. Then after 10,000 years, uh, before 10,000 years, they began to abuse. They invented farming. That is called the agricultural revolution, no? In 10,000 BC, they invented farming. So when they invented farming, of course, they needed land. So they deforested trees, forests, and they built villages, roads. And they, big families were expanded. More children now. In hunters and gatherer society, they have to walk, so children are limited. You can't produce excessive children. Only three children you can produce, one walking, one is on the hip, one is in the stomach, that's it. And uh, uh, they have to walk. So once settlement took place, they invented farming. The food is available now. Food is a guarantee. In hunters and gatherer society, food was not a guarantee, so they couldn't produce many children. But now they know that food is available, now they produce children, only job is producing children. <laughs> and then they pumped up so many humans on the planet, and it became big and they built villages. Village was full, and it was overflowing, they built cities. Cities, nations, here we are. So this is how uh, our species began to inflate on the face of the earth. So that is the time of abuse. So because too many people and they abuse nature, cutting down trees and killing animals for food, and then going and taking the habitats, and then building houses and roads and factories, etc., etc., abuse. Until now, we are abusing. The abuse is to push to the extreme now. The abuse is pushed to extreme. That is what we do. You know the symbol of abuse, I would call it JCP, that motor. JCP is the it's an excellent and perfect symbol of abuse. How it abuses. Actually, we want to abuse with the hand and leg, but we can't. We want to push a tree, we wish, it is a wishful thinking, you push and it should fall down. So you made a machine. So now you are pushing with your own hand. So that is how we want to abuse nature. It shows the, the tyrannical uh, obsession of human beings, how we want to hurt nature. So it is very violent. Uh, what do you expect? We are all born in the lineage of Cain. So what do you expect? So Cain children. So that is the symbol of Cainism, which on JCP. JCP, no? It's huge. You can write an article on JCP about human. Actually, JCP is the uh, outer expression of human 
inner dimension. That is the expression. So we can say, yeah, that violent attitude we have already personified in JCP. That is human today. 2021, describe human, you just bring JCP and show this is human. Yeah, this is. So that is the complete, excellent example uh, how bad humans are. So now, after abuse, right now slowly we are repenting. The human species is now, at least with mixed feeling. And also, there is fear. Oh my God, we are going to extinct. And <laughs> we are facing extinction. Actually, our species, short-lived species on planet Earth. And even frogs, they have been living here almost 415 million years. Yeah, they are living on the planet. Even mosquitoes, 80 million years they have been living here. Even a mouse, 40 million years. Fishes, 600 million years they have been living even today. Crocodiles, 250 million. They belong to dinosaur time. That is Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, those period. The uh, what is it, Mesozoic era. That is the middle epoch, no? Middle age. So these are the three time periods which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, spawned the dinosaurs uh, starting from 200 million to 65, no 250 million to 65 million. So that is the time period which is known as the age of the reptiles, meaning dinosaurs. So they live almost 200 million years, 185 million years they live and then they disappear. But only one failure project is of Mother Earth is Homo sapiens, unfortunately. <laughs> Within four million years. So if there is an exam there, Homo sapiens failed the exam so bad and we failed. We failed in everything. We failed in everything.